My name is Kathy Smith, and I'm honored to be Maryland's Assistant Secretary of State. I provide executive oversight of the Charities and Legal Services Division. Today's town hall provides an overview of charitable organization registration requirements in Maryland through the lens of the Secretary of State, the Comptroller, and the State Department of Assessment and Taxation. We're delighted to offer a series of town halls as an outreach to education uh, to educate charitable organizations, professional solicitors, and fundraising councils who solicit in Maryland, and frankly, to everyone who's interested. As indicated in the email notification about today's town hall, the town hall will be recorded. A link to the recording will be available on the Secretary of State's website under the Charities tab. By choosing to join the town hall, you are consenting to the recording. Uh, please know the content and presentation is provided for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be legal advice. Also, please know that the platform restricts attendance to 500. It's not the Office of the Secretary of State or any other state agency. We have reserved time at the end for questions. So if you hold your questions until then, you may find that your questions are answered as the presentation progresses. And if not, you'll have questions during the Q&A session. You may place questions in the chat box, but please, 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 in order to prevent confusion about the source of the response, do not answer questions placed in the chat box. Someone from the Office of the Secretary of State will announce the questions in the chat box at the end during the Q&A session. Um, also, our staff is available but they are providing guidance only about uh, specific questions you may have. They do not and cannot provide legal advice. It is informational only. If you have a legal question, that's terrific, but please reach out to a legal counsel who specializes in the area of law for which you are seeking legal advice. As we begin today's uh, afternoon session, please mute your microphones if you haven't yet. You may keep your camera on if you like. And with me today is our Division Administrator, Michael Schlein, and from the Comptroller's Office, Andres Zavilla, who is the Manager of Special Functions and Administration in the Revenue Administration Division, Deborah Gorman, the Director of Legal Division, Krista Sermon, the Deputy Director of the Legal Division, and from the State Department of Assessments and Education, we welcome Jasmine Carter, the Deputy Program Manager, Charter Legal, and Maria Mathias. She is the Administrator of Business Personal Property, Franchise Tax and Utility Valuation. Our guests will each address the registration requirements for charities for their respective agencies. To kick our town off, town hall off, allow me to introduce Michael Schlein, the Division Administrator for the Office of the Secretary of State Charity and Legal Services Division. Mike? Thanks, Kathy. Uh, welcome, everybody. Good to have everybody here today. Uh, so I'm going to cover the Secretary of State's portion uh, that involves charities. And uh, <clears throat> our section of law is covered under the uh, the Maryland Solicitations Act, which is in the business regulation article of the Annotated Code of Maryland. Uh, before I get rolling here, uh, one thing I'll throw out up front, uh, we're, we're going to ask Secretary of State and Comptroller that assessments and taxation in that order but that's not necessarily indicative of the order in which you may go about doing or filing things. So um, we're gonna talk about our, our section first, uh, but don't take the order of the presentation uh, as necessarily order in which you must do things as a nonprofit. Um, so charitable solicitation law, uh, what are we doing here? Does my organization have to register, right? Always the good first question to ask. So does an organization have to register with the Secretary of State? So why would an organization have to register? So it, it shall register and receive a registration letter from us before it solicits contributions in Maryland, has contributions solicited on its behalf in Maryland, or solicits contributions, charitable contributions outside of Maryland if the charitable organization is in Maryland. So charitable solicitation, a charitable organization soliciting charitable contributions is why an organization, a nonprofit, would file or register with the Secretary of State's office. Charitable solicitation 
is what we're talking about here. So, and 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 a, an important note uh, that you see towards the bottom of that slide: a donate button is is a solicitation. So, if you ask for money on social media or on the internet, uh, that is a solicitation. So, if you're a charitable organization located in Maryland and you have a donate button on a website, or you ask for money on, I don't know, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. Um, that's all a solicitation and that's asking for contributions and therefore an organization would have to register in that scenario. <clears throat> so a couple other things, what is a contribution? Uh, important to, to talk about a contribution is something, uh, it's a contribution made on a representation that it will be used for a charitable purpose. Uh, and it can include payment, transfer, enforceable pledge of financial help, which includes money, credit, property, services. So a lot of different things can be considered a contribution. Uh, important things to note, charitable contributions do not include an unsolicited gift, government grant or government money. Anybody that sees that second one, if, if you're a 990 filer, you file an IRS form 990 with the IRS and you send a copy of that to us, you know, if you ever look at the lines we tell you to, to, to calculate, to add up, to calculate your charitable contributions, you'll realize, you'll see, we don't ask you to count the government grant or government money line uh, because they are not contributions as defined in the Solicitations Act. Membership assessments, dues or fines, payments for property sold and services rendered, unless it's done in with conjunction with a charitable solicitation and public safety contributions as it's defined in our law uh quickly a public safety contribution is something that uh pledged for helping fire departments law enforcement nonprofits, uh things that are public safety uh driven for the purpose of helping those that are providing public safety so good example is your local volunteer fire department uh, giving money to them uh the local volunteer fire department may not be registered with us because they may only be getting contributions for public safety purposes and our law doesn't uh, make those types of contributions, uh, those organizations register. So charitable solicitation, <clears throat> lots of wording here on what a charitable solicitation oh, yeah. is. Most folks, when they hear charitable solicitation, yeah. thinking of being asked for a charitable contribution, hey, please donate to me. And that is a charitable solicitation, but uh, charitable solicitation within our law means so much more. Uh, the one important uh, or set of important phrasing that I want to point out here is uh, the, the last main bullet point and the sub bullet points underneath of that. If a charitable organization is having a raffle or having a fundraising event or selling merchandise, uh, you know, in conjunction with which an appeal for contributions is made or the name of the charity is used to expressly or implicitly induce a purchase, or where a statement's made that some or all the proceeds of the sale are to be used for a charitable purpose. Any of those asks, any of those sells where that charitable appeal is made to help make that sell, those are all considered charitable solicitations and they would require that the organization register. And not only that, but the revenue raised from those fundraising events, be it a fundraising event or a raffle, the revenue received from those fundraising events also counts towards the total contributions received for the purpose of whether or not an organization has to file a full registration or they're under 25,000, how much registration fee may be owed or uh, what documentation may be owed. And we'll talk about that here in, in a couple slides. So uh, important definitions to know. So registration requirements, what do we do? So talking here about the initial registration process, um, if an organization receives $25,000 or more in charitable contributions in its most recently completed fiscal year, it has to file the full registration paperwork with our office. And that includes all the items listed on this page. You have a registration statement, you have articles of incorporation or other governing bylaws, IRS tax determination letter, IRS form 990 or 990EZ, Maybe you're even a 990PF filer and you solicit, you, you send that instead. Uh, if you're a 990N filer, you would send uh, the state form COF85 to us. Uh, or if you don't file any of the 990 uh, uh, family forms, uh, you would send the COF85 to us as well. That's a 
the, our state version of the financial report and a list of the board of directors, so your current board members. And depending on how much in contributions you're reporting from the prior year, you may also be required to submit a financial review or an audit performed by an independent certified public accountant. Uh, you may have to solicit, uh, submit copies of contracts with professional solicitors or fundraising councils that are soliciting on your behalf if you have them. Uh, if you're affiliated with a state agency, you would disclose that. And if you're over the 750,000 mark, you'd also have to submit something called agreed upon procedures report. And you also may have a registration fee to submit. And the registration fee, if one is owed, ranges somewhere between 50 and $300. And that registration fee is based off of the uh, total, the gross charitable contributions received in the fiscal year that's being reported. So a lot of information that has to be submitted, uh, and this can be submitted on paper form still, but also it can be submitted online through the Secretary of State's one-stop portal for charity registration. So you can go do everything online right now. Uh, one of the benefits of doing it online is the, as you answer the these initial series of questions, the, the form will guide you to the right information. It will guide you to all the stuff as you answer the form. It'll continue to build and take you down the right path to make sure all this, if all of this is needed, all of this uh, is answered and submitted on the registration form. And then every year after, uh, there are annual registration requirements, and the uh, the registration is due ten and a half months uh, at the end of the organization's fiscal year. And with that, it's an annual updated registration form. Another 990 or 990 EZ, or maybe even, you know, we get a few 990 PF filers. Uh, if none of them, you would be submitting a COF 85. Again, 990N, uh, it's just a little postcard, doesn't have a lot of information. We're not going to take that for a full registration. You're going to do that state COF 85 form, updated list of board of directors. And if, if articles of incorporation or bylaws or other governing instrument has changed since the last time it was submitted, you would send us the updated version of that. And this stuff is all due 10 and a half months after the organization's fiscal year ends. So say maybe, for example, my fiscal year ends December 31st, 2022. This stuff would be due 10 and a half months after that, November 15th of 2023. So there are other things that may be required annually as well. And, and this list is going to look very familiar because it's essentially the same thing as the last page financial auditor review if at those thresholds, copies of contracts with professional solicitors or fundraising councils if, if applicable, uh, affiliation with a state agency, maybe agreed upon procedures reports if over 750,000 in contributions and registration fee. Again, 25,000 or more in contributions being reported, registration fee is gonna range somewhere between 50 and $300. Uh, one exception to that is if your organization receives less than $25,000 per year in charitable contributions, but uses the services of a professional solicitor, it will have to file the, the full set of registration paperwork and pay a $50 registration fee. Again, this can also be done online. Uh, if you haven't claimed a record on the one-stop portal, uh, we have an, you have an email from us telling you to do that. Check it out, claim the record. We have user guide videos on our charity page as well that kind of show you the step-by-step -step on how to go about completing that process. But you can also follow your annual registrations online. And the same thing as a new registration, it, it walks you right down this path based on the answers to each question. It'll build the form out so that it ensures that you submit all this information that is due and you can pay online as well. Uh, Organizations that receive less than $25,000 per year have a more abbreviated filing requirement. So uh, they file something called an exempt organization fundraising notice form, and they're going to have to file this annually. And uh, if they file a 990 or 990EZ or even 990PF, the form is going to ask you if you file one. If you check, you do, you'll attach it. And if you don't file one, you won't have to attach it. And uh, IRS tax determination letter if the organization is a 501c3, it'll attach its IRS determination letter uh, that shows its 501c3 status. And again, that's a yes, no, or pending question on the form. Uh, there's no wrong answer to that question. If you're under $25,000 per year, you're not going to have to file the full set of registration paperwork. 
So you don't necessarily have to have an IRS tax determination letter in order to file the exempt organization fundraising notice form. And uh, again, same uh, as the full registration paperwork, this can be done online. And based on the way you answer the first few questions, if you're under $25,000 per year or for the year being reported, the form's gonna direct you down the path of the exempt organization fundraising notice form rather than asking for the full set of registration paperwork. So the, the system's gonna know the one-stop system based on the answers provided, what needs to be submitted to us if you do this online. This can also still be filed in paper for now, but uh, online, um, you know, again, claim your record if you haven't already, uh, check out the system, check out the user guides and, and the, uh, the video about claiming the record and getting into the one-stop portal. It's a pretty good video, complete, and kind of walks you through each step. Um, so a couple other things real quick uh, before moving on to the next uh, to the next crew. Um, yeah, I met you hear me mention online filing. Uh, you can do that now. You can pay online. Anybody that's having issues with that, uh, you know, reach out. Or if you didn't get an email about claiming a record and you're the record, you know, the email address of record for the charity. Uh, you know, reach out to the DL charity underscore SOS at maryland.gov email address. Don't worry, that will be on the last slide as well, our contact information and, and get us to update the information or resend the, the email uh, about getting on the one stop and filing online. And, um, you know, just uh, reach out if you have questions, uh, but check out those user guys and the user videos if you're going online, they are very helpful and they're there to help you out and uh, we want to see you succeed so uh you know where to find us and uh kathy any other points you want to mention uh before we turn it over to the controller i think we'll just keep moving thanks mike all right andres uh, andres aviles is the manager special functions and administration of the revenue administration division of the comptroller's office uh comptroller maryland andres i'm going to turn it over to you Thank you so much, uh, uh, Michael, and thank you, Miss um, uh, Kathleen Smith, for the opportunity given us to the Comptroller's Office to share uh, important information with folks out there in the nonprofit uh, business. Um, so, for that, um, the Comptroller's Office offers a sales and use tax exemption certificate for those who perform any charitable <clears throat> or donation or any type of work or mission or view of your organization. So before we enter into all of these, um, I also wanna uh, say thank you to my colleagues, uh, uh, Deborah Gorman, the legal uh, director for our, our controller's office, and as well as Krista Sermon, the deputy legal uh, of the division. So um, what is it the, Comptroller's Office requires to issue the certificate uh, to nonprofit organizations. So let's start that the sales and users tax essential certificate will, qual will qualify for certain qualifying nonprofit organization that allows them to make a specific purchases without paying sales and use tax. And the certificate can be renewed every five years. As a matter of fact, um, the renewal process that for those certificate holders they ended in september 30th 2022 we started the renewal process in may and as of now we have about 11,000 nonprofit organizations that were successfully renewed so and we continue doing that through the entire uh, uh, process of the renewal process uh, here what we're talking about is the initial before you get um, to get the, to use the card, to use the exception certificate. So for that, organization that may qualify for uh, these exemptions are those who are uh, nonprofit charitable, educational and religious uh, organizations, uh, volunteer fire companies and rescue squads, uh, nonprofit cemeteries companies, qualifying veterans organizations, government agencies, and of course, um, credit unions. So those are the organizations that could qualify for this exemption. We'll go in details what is it that that organization needs to do to successfully obtain the, say, exemption card. So we can go to the next slide. 
by law, Maryland can only issue one exception certificate and for those who are located in the state of Maryland and also for those who are located in the adjacent jurisdictions such as Delaware, Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia, and Washington, D.C. This certificate that has been or is going to be issued to those nonprofit organizations are printed in a white paper with green ink, the letter will be green ink, and contains an expiration date of September 30th, 30th 2027. Um, those certificates that is issued to governmental entities are printed also in a white paper. However, the is printed on a red ink, and the purpose of that is to differentiate from the regular organization versus this one. This one does not expire, and, and it it will hold it for the entire of its life. So that's the purpose of those two. Uh, so. What the organization can do with this car, they may use this exchange certificate to purchase tangible personal property, which they would need to use to carry on its work. Uh, it could be any supplies, office supplies, or any type of supplies or items that the organization may need in order to perform their mission. Um, the exemption certificate the looks of it is like a wallet size car and it bears the holder's eight digit exemption number with an expiration date. Um, this certificate is not transferable. You cannot pass this on to all the one to use. It has to be used by the organization. Uh, and also applies to purchase made by the registered organization. So <clears throat> now we're gonna talk about on the next slide, how can you apply for the sales and use tax exemption certificate? There's a very easy way we have, uh, you can obtain this, the Maryland um, SUTEC application form uh, on our uh, Maryland website, uh, MarylandTaxes.gov. There you can retrieve that and print that application, fill it out, attach the required documentation and send it to us or uh, you can contact our taxpayer services division at the number that is displayed there um, during business hours, Monday through Friday, and request that application to be sent to you. Um, once you get that application, you can fill this out, attaching the required documentation and submit it to the address that is uh, showing on this presentation. Now, let's take a, a closer look of the sales and use tax application form. Um, and the next three slides, the first one that you see here in front of you is just a snapshot of the first part of the one uh, page long of this form. And uh, this part, line one through four, is the on the organization's information. What is it that we need from, from you? We need your federal, uh, employee identification number. We will need the full legal of the uh, the full legal name of the organization, the physical address of line three, um, whether it's in Maryland or any of the adjacent jurisdictions uh, that I mentioned before, um, and the mailing address on line four. Now, I like to mention that on the mailing address and the physical address. If you have a PO box that would you where would you like to the card for that card exemption card to be sent to, uh, you can use that PO box, but it has to be on line four on the mailing address. A PO box cannot be used on line three for physical location. We will not. We will reject the application. Or we ask the um, the nonprofit to give us a physical location. Um, where the nonprofit performs their work. So the next slide is the second part of that form, um, which contained two uh, authorized officers of that organization. What we need is the full information for these two officers. Where we need their full name, title, uh, 
if they have an email address and uh, telephone number, that will be great. The social security number is required. We must um, obtain this information. Uh, two officers is enough. Um, if you believe there is more than two officers, they could act this. You can add an, an additional page with the same information, but two should be enough. Um, the next slide will go over the last part of that form. Line six, I hope you guys can see the fine print there. I'll try my best to make it a little bigger, but um, on line six, what we want from the nonprofit organization is to uh, briefly describe the business activity of that organization. Uh, usually the uh, business activity is stated in the bylaws or any other organizing document. So you may um, briefly state there what's the purpose, the vision, or the mission of the nonprofit. Uh, so that we have an idea what this organization is doing. On line seven, you must indicate whether um, you are qualified under the 501c3 Internal Revenue Code. Uh, if you do check yes, then you provide a copy of the, of the Internal Revenue Service uh, 501c3 letter. We we'll call it the termination letter. If you're not under the 51C3 and you believe you're still qualified for an exemption certificate for sales and use, you must provide the section of the Internal Revenue Code that you believe you could qualify. And from that point forward, our uh, SUTEC team will review your application uh, along with the legal division and will determine if you could qualify under the on the other circumstances other than the 501c3, c4, and c19. Um, the last part is just the signature part uh, where we ask the authorized officer to sign in the title and date the form. If for any reason the authorized officers listed on line 5, 8, or B uh, cannot sign the form, it can be signed by a third person that you designate, but a power of attorney needs to be submitted and it needs to identify that the person is signing on behalf of the corporation acting in that capacity. Um, if it is, check that box where it says attach power of attorney and we'll review um, that application as well. So what is it that you're going to need to submit with this form? One page long form you have you will have five documents to submit and there are the documents the first things that we need is copy of your internal revenue service determination letter a 501c3 5 um, c4 or c19 and i believe for cemeteries uh, organization is c13 it's not listed there but you can attach that excuse me um, also, what we need is copy of the organization's articles of incorporation and any other organizing document. Also, we need a copy of the organization bylaws. If the bylaws has signature lines or signature block at the end of the document, please have the authorized officers or officers or members of the organization to sign it. Uh, if it is not, then it should be good to go. <clears throat> for organization physically located located in Maryland, and that's the part with our um, partner, the Maryland Department of Assessment and Taxation comes into play, which I wanted to thank them for their due diligence and for their eager to help out the taxpayers, especially the nonprofit, to get the good standing um, square away so they can successfully renew or applied for the sales and use tax exemption. So um, for what we need here for those um, nonprofit organization located in Maryland is a letter of a good standing from the Maryland Department uh, Assessment and Taxation. For those organizations, they are located outside of Maryland or, in, or I mean, in the adjacent jurisdictions that I mentioned before, uh, they must attach a letter or certificate of good standing of that jurisdiction uh, in lieu of the Maryland uh, good standing letter from the Department of Assessment and Taxation. And lastly, uh, any other documentation 
that is that is, is that is specified by our sales and use tax applications instruction. Um, there are certain documentation that we need in addition to all of that, depending on the type of organization that are applying. Uh, for instance, religious organization, we need additional documentation uh, that prove they have a location here, a rental agreement or a bulletin where they have their their mass and, and a specific date and time. Uh, any other uh, type of advertisement that they have um, to promote their uh, religious views. So with this, <clears throat> I believe it's conclude this part of the sales and use tax exemption certificate. Now, um, I'd like to say this, the controller's office is more than happy to help anyone that needs guidance, help with the sales and use tax exemption certificate. Please reach out to us. At the end of the, um, the presentation, you will see the contact numbers and the email address. So you please reach out to us and we'll be glad to help you out. Um, also, I would like to um, thank uh, the Maryland Department of Assembly Taxation for you know, their support on this renewal process and also for the first time applicant. Uh, and uh, well, without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, to you guys the next presenter. I believe her name is Jasmine Cotter from the Department of uh, Assessment and Taxation. And um, turn the floor to you. And thank you. Okay. Thank you for that introduction. Um, we are so excited to be here today to discuss some of the requirements when uh, you um, will bring your entity to the state of Maryland and attempt to uh, register with our department. So it was discussed um, some earlier, but um, our department, specifically the Department of Assessments and Taxation, the Charter Legal Division, we help entities with forming in Maryland, um, forming their entity in Maryland, uh, being able to uh, prove that they have the right to do business in Maryland. Um, once the entity has been created in Maryland, we also um, will help with amending the charter of the entity once created or dissolving the business at some point uh, once the business has been uh, formed in Maryland. So first, we're just going to start off with some of those requirements um, to start a business um, with in Maryland. So first, you want to choose your business structure. Um, in Maryland, there are, there are a number of different entity types that are available to form a business. So there are different business structures, and you just want to do some research about exactly what type of business you want to start, and then also um, kind of see some of the cons and pros for starting that specific business structure. Um, we always suggest that people review the forms that are provided by SDAT. Our forms have been drafted in conformity with Maryland law. So when you use our forms, you're basically just going to have to insert uh, the appropriate information in the blank spaces that we provide. And also the formation documents will always um, include instructions. And you can use those instructions just to make sure that your document um, is you know, complete as possible and also up to date with the current law. Um, if there are any changes to the law, we will amend our forms and put them back on our form page. Uh, so you can just be assured that when you're submitting that form, it's up to date with uh, the Maryland corporate law for the entity you are attempting to form. Also, you will need to determine who will be your resident agent in Maryland. Each entity that is formed with our department must have a Maryland resident agent. So that can be a Maryland individual who is 18 years of older, or it can be a domestic Maryland LLC or corporation. But each entity that forms with this department will need to appoint a resident agent. So that, that's something you want to keep in mind. If you are a Maryland resident who is over the age of 18, you can be your own resident agent. But something to remember is is that you cannot uh, use the entity that you are forming to be uh, the resident agent for that business. So simply put, your business cannot be its own resident agent. So that is something you want to remember when submitting your formation documents. And then finally, um, we provide a charter help email and also a phone number. So if you have questions, you can get them into the department prior to filing your document. 
Um, our phone lines are open every day from 8.30 until 3.30 p.m. So that's a really fast way to get in contact with the department. But also if you have a question where you may want to um, upload attachments or it's longer, you can also send us an email. So review your document. Before you submit your document online or by mail, you want to make sure that you have those questions answered just to prevent any rejection if time is of the essence for you submitting that document. Um, if you are opening a bank account uh, in conjunction with this filing, you want to make sure that you have the appropriate documents. Some uh, financial institutions will require you to provide a certificate of status, and that's a certificate that will state that the entity is in good standing and active in Maryland. And other financial, financial institutions will require you to provide a certified copy of your formation document. And that's going to be an exact uh, copy of the document that we approved, but it will have the Maryland seal on the document um, so that it certifies that the document was filed with SDAT. So if you believe that you want to um, open up a bank account at the time of forming that entity, check with that financial institution and see if they have any additional requirements uh, in order for you to open that bank account. And then finally, file your formation document. Um, we highly encourage that you file the document online through the Maryland Business Express. Everything from your confirmation to the approval of the document will be sent by email. In addition, um, those certified copies or certificates of status that are ordered will also be sent to you by email. So it cuts down that waiting process where you have to see if your document's approved and then you have to wait for the documents to come to you by mail if you send it to our department by mail. So we highly encourage you to file it online through the Maryland Business Express. And we have a non-expedited, regular expedited, and same-day processing all available for you online through the Maryland Business Express. Um, and then, you know, like we discussed earlier, the you want to consider the cost if necessary for the certificate of status or any certified copy. Um, the fastest processing time right now that we offer by far, whether you're doing expedited or non-expedited, would be online just because the documents move faster online. And it's also easy for um, resubmission should you need to resubmit a document. Um, now we're going to discuss um, some of the most common um, entity types that are formed with our department when choosing to form a charitable um, entity within Maryland. So typically, if someone wants to form a charitable um, entity in Maryland, it is going to be a non-stock corporation. Um, so what is a non-stock corporation? Um, in essence, the most simple answer is that a non-stock corporation will be a corporation that does not have the authority to issue stock or have shareholders. And so we have three um, of those non-stock corporations in Maryland that you can form on a state level. So first, um, you can file articles of incorporation for a non-stock corporation. And this is going to be a corporation that is not going to make an election to be tax exempt or religious. This is the most uh, basic non-stock corporation that you can form in Maryland. Um, typically, we see some of the town home associations or real estate entities form uh, non-stock corporations that are not religious or tax exempt. So articles of incorporation for non-stock corporation, your base filing fee is going to be $120. And then, of course, if you expedite the document, you can also add that expedite fee in. Uh, next, we will have articles of incorporation for a tax exempt non stock corporation. So, this is a corporation that has elected some tax exemption. Um, our form will have the requirements um, as far as language that is required by the IRS should you want to make an election with the federal government to be tax exempt. 
we provide the um, language that is required by the Internal Revenue Code. So if you want to form a tax exempt entity, we have the language that is necessary. What we sometimes see is that some people will um, form a corporation that is a regular non-stock corporation and they do not um, include the election to be tax exempt. And so at some point, they have to come back to our department to amend the Articles of Incorporation to provide that language that we already have within the tax exempt articles, um, or they want to dissolve the original corporation that they form and then file Articles of Incorporation again for a tax exempt entity. Um, so you can, you know, review our form and see if maybe that language is something that would be necessary for the corporation type that you are attempting to form in Maryland. An additional $50 will be charged for what's called the Maryland Non-Profit Development Fund. Uh, basically, we send this $50 to the fund and is required for any entity in Maryland that's seeking that tax exempt election under uh, sections 501c3, c4, or c6 of the Internal Revenue Code. And then finally, we have articles of incorporation for a religious corporation. So the purpose of this religious corporation um, will always include the purpose to be a congregation or place of worship. And our documents, um, as far as the requirements of our documents, um, they are controlled by the Maryland Annotated Code, uh, the Corporations and Associations title. So what are some of the most common form requirements when you are forming a corporation in Maryland? First is that the entity name must contain what's called a corporate tail. And this is some form of corporation, whether it be um, abbreviated or the full word. So I've included some of the most common, you'll see corporation, incorporated, Inc, Corp, LTD um, for limited, these are some of the tails that we will allow for your entity in Maryland. And then there are also additional corporate tails that may apply to your business, like if you're attempting to form a public benefit uh, corporation. So you can also um, review the statute if you think that the, your corporate tail um, may be different for the entity that you are forming in Maryland. The uh, address, this was also kind of mentioned earlier um, that in Maryland, um, for most entities, when you attempt uh, to form a file a document for your corporation, um, we do not accept for domestic corporations, PO box um, locations or shipping locations as the principal office or resident agent location. Um, one for the resident agent, uh, this will be a person who will be served with a uh, service of process in case the entity is ever sued. And so we want to be able to find the person or entity that is serving as the resident agent. And we're not going to be able to do so, you know, at your local um, FedEx or UPS office. So we require a physical location. And then for your principal office location, this must also be a physical location within the state of Maryland. This is a very common rejection reason. So you can um, avoid it by just knowing, you know, before you submit that document, that you will need a physical location when you submit uh, that the article. And then finally, um, once we approve that, the Articles of Incorporation, our department will issue a unique department identification number, and that number will be the only number in Maryland for um, this specific entity. So you can use this number to one, prove that you have the right to do business in Maryland, and also when it comes time to file that yearly state report, that number will be used to receipt that report each year. So that number is very important and it's very unique to the business that you form. And I've all, for this slide, I've included some of uh, the new laws that have recently taken effect um, here at ESTAT October 1. So first we have uh, non-stock corporations. So this applies to what we've been discussing. Um, if a non-stock corporation has been forfeited by the state of Maryland, they may revive by filing the seven most recently due annual reports in a form called Articles of Revi Revival. Previously, if a non-stock corporation was um, forfeited by the department, all past due yearly annual reports 
up into the most current report must um, were required to be filed. So sometimes this required non-stock corporations to go back, you know, 20, 30 years um, with these annual reports. So the law has changed. And if for some reason the entity that you form is forfeited in Maryland, um, you will not have to file all of the past due yearly reports. If you choose to file the revival in those seven most recently due reports online through the Maryland Business Express. Second, um, we have same day processing that is now available for non-stock corporations online through the Maryland Business Express. So if you want to file your document for same day review, uh, you don't have to worry about, you know, dropping it off at the department or sending it by mail. You can pay for your documents and get it all reviewed that same day. Um, you're just required to file your document by 2.30 p.m. that day. Articles of dissolution uh, to dissolve a Maryland corporation may, may now be effective up to 30 days after the articles are accepted for record. Previously, corporations were not allowed to include an effective date or time within the articles of incorporate, um, excuse me, the articles of dissolution. They were only effective uh, when the department accepted those articles. So when are you going to file articles of dissolution? If um, the entity has decided to wind up its business in Maryland and it will no longer uh, be cons considered an active corporation, you can file articles of dissolution to dissolve that corporation. And now you can also include that effective time uh, with that document. And finally, we have an outdated or improper address affidavit. This affidavit may be filed um, for the use or maintenance of an improper address in our records. Uh, so this happens sometimes when people form an entity in Maryland or someone else forms an entity and the real property owner may notice that their uh, home is being used um, as a resident agent location or a principal office location and they have not given the authority as such. Now you can file this affidavit and if the department agrees with the allegations that are alleged within the affidavit, we will void that document and remove um, that principal office or resident agent information from our Maryland Business Express uh, general filing tab. And now um, my uh, colleague Maria will be taking over this part. Thanks, Jasmine. Um, I'm Maria Mathias and I am with the Business Personal Property uh, Unit of the State Department of Assessments and Taxation. So there is a requirement, and that's under Tax Property Article 11-101, that covers the requirement to file a Form 1 annual report. And if you have personal property, if you're using furniture fixtures, tools, machinery, and equipment, whether you own, lease, or rent it, then you're required to fill out a business personal property return. That, when you finish filling that out, um, you will end up with a business personal property assessment. You can move on to the next one. Okay, so there is an exemption for that personal property that you may, that you own if you are granted the exemption as a charitable or educational entity in Maryland. And that's co covered under tax property article 7-202. Again, it grants an exemption for personal property assessment and taxation for assets owned by the entities deemed charitable or educational by SDAT. Let's say we do deem you exempt from assessment, but you have a, a lease with maybe RICO. Um, we will assess RICO and based on the terms of your lease agreement, they may pass on whatever resulting bill from that assessment to you. Um, we get approximately 50 to 60 applications every year. Um, we saw the greatest uptick, I think, in 2020. And in 2021, we saw just slightly under 70 applications. We can move on to the next one. Okay, um, the applications can be found on our website, um, dat.maryland.gov. There's also an application for your real property if you need um, you know, to get an exemption for that. Um, I can give you an example. There were a few um, 
let's say um, businesses that had um, a, um, property that they would use just for their um, operation that we deemed exempt. However, they would sometimes rent out some of that for let's say weddings or other social or recreational um, operations that weren't tied to their charitable operation. And we will sometimes assess a portion of that. So we base most of our um, application on what has been decided by the Maryland courts. So you need to have a stated purpose. You need to have, we need to know what that is and the actual work that's accomplished, the extent to which the work actually, you know, performs, you know, a benefit for um, the community and uh, the welfare, public welfare, and the um, support that is given, the amount of support that's given by charitable donations. So there are a few things where Maryland law is a little bit stricter. Um, so that not every 501c3 will necessarily get the exemption from personal property assessment and then taxation. Um, things that are social in nature, recreational, uh, let's say hobby support or political advocacy, those things wouldn't necessarily get an exemption because there's an exclusive an exclusiveness to um, their operation. Okay, so this is all of our contact information. If you have any questions, you can call our audit team. They are the ones that actually log in all the applications and then make the decision. Um, I want to remind everybody, we don't, you can't call in and say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this as my business where we would say, oh yeah, you're exempt. Okay, it's always decided after you've formed and your first filing requirement of the form one is done. We don't do it in advance. And then you must be in good standing for us to grant that exemption. Okay. I think that's it for me. Thanks, Maria. Well, mm -hmm. uh, Mike, Andres, Jasmine, Marie, thanks so much. It's a great presentation. I'm really thrilled. So for everyone's benefit, I know there are a few folks who hopped on a little late. Just that the town hall was recorded and a recording will be available on the Secretary of State's website under the Charities tab. Um, and of course, by choosing to uh, participate, you consented to the recording. So I hope today's town hall was informative. I feel free to drop a note in the chat box if you have suggestions about future town halls related to the uh, Maryland Solicitations Act or regulations. We're happy to consider topics that are within the scope of our authority and our capacity. Uh, so let's go to some questions. I think we have some. Robbie, 